All right. Well, welcome, Clint. Um, we are here with Clint Dahl from Dirt Draft, and he is going to introduce himself and give us a little bit of information on what he does. But um, this particular seminar is talking about the future of racing and race and performance in particular. And one of the reasons we invited Clint to come speak with us was because what Dirt Draft does and some of his other businesses are really look at some of the aspects of racing, particularly fan involvement, um, that are different than the traditional way that racers have, you know, encouraged fans or that people have gotten involved in racing or gotten um, into the fan aspect, not into the cars themselves so much, but in, into the enjoyment of it. And as we look at how racing is involved, is evolving, may evolve in the future, um, I would say that these, these elements are an essential part of, of how that will happen moving forward. And we will probably have future discussions about what that means more in car or at the track. Um, and Clint, I'm sure you have some thoughts about that too. But first of all, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, what your businesses do. Yeah, so so Clint Dahl, co-owner of, of Dirt Draft. I have a couple other partners in, in that business. We launched Dirt Draft in July of 2019. And uh, we, we built Dirt Draft um, basically on the demand of fans wanting something, some type of interaction with mm -hmm. their short track racing. We've heard it for years and years and years. And every year we would talk about building something. We just, you know, something would get more important. So finally, we just, um, we got our heads together and said, we're going to do this and um, uh, launched it uh, July of 2019 and instant, instant um, appreciation from the fans, subscriptions, everyone wanted to be a part of it. Uh, and again, the, the whole premise of it was to engage fans deeper with the events, the series, the drivers, the sponsors, um, and have a vested interest into those, those events. And uh, it's, it's, work, it's worked well since. So we've been very thrilled with the results and uh, the user participation and, and everyone, and including Racing Junk, who has participated in, and been involved in it. Excellent. Um, can you explain to anybody who's watching who isn't as familiar with it, like, Dirt Draft is, is, can be easily described as like a fantasy element for sure. dirt racing, but that is a little bit oversimplified. So if you can give us just a little bit stronger sense of, of what sets it apart from like, say, NASCAR's fantasy draft, um, which, you know, we've looked at before, but for my mind, it's sort of like, oh, okay, you can pick some stuff. I, I feel like Dirt Draft is more involved. I feel like it has more of an interaction with actual racing, that there's more of a, a personal feel to it. Sure. Um, yeah, so if you could just tell us a little bit more about about what sets it apart. That's yeah, so that's you know, for from, from, from a grassroots perspective, you know, <laughs> everyone has their short track racing hero. Right. And uh, how Dirt Draft works is um, you're a subscriber to Dirt Draft and every event, and these are all the national uh, events across the country in short track racing, World of Outlaws, Lucas Oil, USAC, USMTS Modifieds, and, and some other regional events in there as well, is that as you're a subscriber, you are given a $100,000 salary, a fake salary, that you can... <laughs> uh, that you can use on every event. You have to select five drivers and every driver has a value associated with them and that their value changes mm -hmm. uh, from race to race, depending on how they've done or how they've done in the past at that track. So all you need to do is select five drivers and stay under that $100,000 salary cap. Um, so you now have this vested interest with these this team of five drivers that you, um, you may not have uh, cared about before. So, um, as the night goes on, you earn points. And then uh, depending on how many points you end up with at the end of the night, you earn a point towards our speed shop. And this is what kind of differentiates uh, Dirt Draft from say like a FanDuel or DraftKings. It's kind of a, a cross between a uh, FanDuel DraftKings and a Dave and Busters. Whereas you have these points and now you can take these points into our speed shop and redeem them for tickets to events, pay-per-views, merchandise, subscriptions, experiences, lifestyle stuff. Um, but to your point, it, it really does give the fan a personalized connection to a, a driver that they may not have had before. Um, and, and more so, I'll say this, and we found this so interesting and fun. The cross-pollination is a fancy word I like to use. Cross-pollination of fan bases that have been a part of this. So think about it. If you're a dirt late model fan, to some degree, you don't really pay a lot of attention maybe to a wing sprint car or non-sprint car world. Um, if you're a sprint car fan, you may not care about a dirt late model guy. But now that you have this vested interest in uh, whatever event you're, you're uh, participating in, suddenly as a Dirt Lake Model fan, you, you care and want to know who Jacob Allen is or mm -hmm. Aaron Wright. Likewise, if you're a sprint car person, you may not have known who a Kate Dillard was or, or, or an Ashton Winger uh, on that side of things. But now you do because you've 
you've drafted them into your team and you have this, this vested interest in hoping that they perform well. Excellent. Um, I saw Keith, there we go. Keith just joined us. So I'm hoping that A, he'll be able to hear us and B, that we'll be able to see him. So thank you for the explanation, Clint. I will hopefully be editing out all of this in between. Um, <laughs> no I couldn't Keith. stop laughing as I was talking and Keith popped up. I'm like, all right, he's here. <laughs> uh, just let me to this. I... Uh, great, you can hear, yay, but I can't see you. I'm wondering why I can't see you. Um, let's see. Nope, all of those things should allow us to, um, ah, <laughs> okay, well, welcome, Keith, if you can hear, um, we may not be able to see your beautiful face, but if you can talk, just go ahead and unmute yourself if you're able to, and we will include you in the conversation. Okay, let's give it a try. Great. Okay, can you hear us, Keith? Oh, no. Let's see. Great. Okay, Keith can hear us, but you can't, we can't hear you. So let's see if there's a way to fix that. I'm not sure there's a way to fix that. I think that must, might be on your end, Keith. Um, well, we will keep going. And if you are able to hear or to speak, um, Let me, oh, he's going to log it in on his laptop. So Clint, why don't you and I, I'll, I'll continue our conversation a little bit okay. about dirt draft. So Keith's going to log it on his laptop. Um, so one of the things that does make dirt draft really interesting is that personal aspect, right? You choose the driver, sure. you have that connection with them. And I think that's something that is very specific to to dirt track racing in general, right? It feels, it has always to me felt like a much more personal type of racing, sure. right? Because it's, um, it's very visceral for one thing, <laughs> right? Um, and it is, it, it tends to be um, a little bit more no holds barred, I think. So people get into it and they, there's a fearlessness to it and a, a little bit, um, I want to say fewer rules it's not that but it is it has its own perspective and its own presentation and so i think that the type of fantasy drafting that dirt draft allows is really it falls well in line with what i think of as, as dirt track fans and dirt track racers um yeah I that agree. makes I mean, sense right for sure i, I think it would be hard to argue against this that dirt track fans are, are some of if not the most mm -hmm. passionate uh, totally. fans in all of motorsports uh, and loyal and right. very loyal absolutely. Um, absolutely. so yeah that goes without saying I mean un unlike NASCAR you know a fan can spend 30 or 40 dollars and go to a pit buy a pit pass and walk right, right. in and talk with their favorite driver and hang out and have a beer after exactly exactly so, yeah so that that personal connection certainly is there um, you know at the track as well um, yeah it's it's um, it's certainly different than any type of, of motorsport out there I, I would say NHRA um, you know, having the, the fan having access to the pits, right. maybe even monster truck racing, but right. you're not going to be able to sit down after the the race and and drink some um, some bush lights, right? With, uh, right. with Boom Briggs necessarily. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Totally. Um, I think that's really true, and I think it it also is a demonstration of of the way that the racing in general is evolving. Right. Like this is an aspect to racing that allows fans to participate, even if they can't go to the track. Hmm. Right. And I think that's yeah. something that's really important as well. Yes. Um, while some of dirt track racing is is televised, um, it tends to be a pretty localized experience as well. Um, and so this is a way to connect fans with it, even if they are kind of following on the websites or following on the live streams, right? They might subscribe to World of Outlaws and, and watch that or, you know, some of it is televised, but um, it lets them connect with an experience that would otherwise be something that they would be doing on a Friday night, right? 
Yeah, you're um, exactly right. And, you know, that that's one interesting part about, um, I mean, motorsports in general over the last 10 years mm-hmm. is how technology has, has changed everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and more so as we just kind of went over the interaction right. that the fans have with these drivers, whether whether it be social media. I mean, 10 years ago, there right. it wasn't, I mean, there was Twitter, it was in infancy, but it, no right. one really Twitter knew about it. Right. Um, online media coverage through um, through the different uh, websites who now do this on regular. You you know, every week there's there's multiple media outlets that are at the events covering this and giving you content, photos, videos, whatever it might be. Um, the explosion of online streaming of these events, yeah. um, maybe relative to uh, the you know the, the COVID situation that we're into. I mean, there's always been this massive network of race fans, but. Um, you know, 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, you know, we couldn't connect um, as easily as we do now. Um, right. Kind of waited for your, you know, in our world, you waited for your mid-American newspaper to show up. And totally. About Scott Bloomquist or Billy Moyer or Freddie Smith. Uh, yeah. But now you can jump on the old Twitter machine or, or Facebook or, or whatever and interact with, with uh, anyone you want. But um, certainly, in my opinion, the, the explosion of broadcast and streaming services over this last six, eight, ten months has been um, a game changer for for everybody involved. Um, Absolutely, yeah, including us as well. Absolutely, um, I think it. You know, I, if Keith is able to join us, hopefully he can speak to this. And if not, I'll kind of speak for them a little bit. And Tulsa has been really at the forefront of streaming their events and making sure that fans have access to them, whether it's live or whether it is in person um, and, and really providing that access. And not every small track can do that certainly, right? Um, unless they're able to partner with somebody. So I think that it's also the benefit of something like Dirt Drop is that it connects people with um, big and small tracks and series, right? It, 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 it creates this momentum of interest in dirt racing in, um, in the community, which ha- racing of all sorts has always been so community driven. And I think one of the the appealing things about the fantasy drafting is that you can still demonstrate your favorites. You can still be a fan, even if you, again, can't access your community immediately. Mm-hmm. And while we have all of these different ways to do it, racing is also something where you knowing the person and being able to root for that person is also really fun, right? You pick your favorite for a reason. Right, whether it's how they drive, whether you like their flair, whether you just are, you know, whether you know them, right? Again, there's there's so much about racing that is based in the community that people come from, right? I think race fans are find that essential. Um, I think I want to go on to to asking you a few questions. So I, I want to have you think kind of more globally, but also very locally. And, and <laughs> those are probably not accurate terms in that I, I really want you to think time-wise, right? Like, so think about um, the direct, <sighs> if you can look at the way that racing has evolved probably over the last decade um, and talk a little bit about the, um, the changes that you have seen and the evolution of it in the aspects of motorsports you've been involved in. You've been involved in it for quite a while. Um, and then I'd also like to compare that to how it's changed over the last few months and and how those things have, have connected, um, which I know is a big question, so I can help direct it a little bit. But, um, you know, we've definitely seen, we've seen big changes, right? And some of it is what we just talked about. Like things are streaming. You can access the racers in a way you couldn't before. Um, there, are, there are various personality aspects to it, but, um, the nature of racing itself. How how what kind of changes have you seen there into the to both the the overall and to individual components of it? Yeah, I think it kind of goes back to what we were talking a second ago. Was uh, for me and everything that I've seen over the last decade, it, it's all um, it, it's technology driven. Um, mm-hmm. We kind of spoke to that a little bit. Just the the access that fans have to drivers through through social media, etc. Um, you know, I can remember, you know, one of our companies is Firethorn Marketing, you know, 10 years ago, we're, we're begging our tracks and our series, please, please get a Facebook page, please get a Twitter account. Um, it'll benefit you. And, you know, they were resisting, they didn't want to do it. Um, and now everyone has it. In fact, um, I personally, and, and probably most people as well, um, when they're looking for information on, on the event or the series, first thing I do is I go to Twitter. I don't go mm-hmm. to necessarily the, the tracks website. Totally. Um, yeah. Um, you know, again, 10 years ago as well, uh, 
you know, tracks were, were um, you know, maybe putting up a little bit of a fight for the broadcasting and streaming side of things, worried that uh, it would it would kill their their bottom line or their attendance. And um, you know, I think what we've seen through this last six months is that um, the, the streaming services have been a massive benefit to a lot of the entities that, um, that can utilize them. Um, now, specifically over the last six months, I, I guess I would probably just reemphasize those things we mentioned there is the the necessity and the need uh, for just not the series and the tracks and mm-hmm. events, but the drivers to utilize their social accounts. Um, you know, the, the need uh, for continued online media coverage. And again, as we spoke earlier, the absolute explosion of broadcast streaming and pay-per-views mm-hmm. simply because as, as we all know, fans couldn't necessarily um, attend. Right. So, um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's always been this massive network of, of fans, but we're now we're just so much more connected uh, than we were 10 years ago and, and now more so um, than, than ever before. Excellent. Keith, welcome. It's so nice to see your face, or at least the side of your face. <laughs> Let me shut my door real quick. No worries. How's everybody today? We are Thank good. Thank you. Sorry about the technical adventures. Yeah. Um, well, we were we were chatting a little bit about how how racing has evolved, but I'd love it if you could give us just a little bit of an introduction. I obviously know who you are, um, but if you could just introduce yourself for our audience, and um, you know, you you wear a lot of hats, <laughs> and I suspect you're wearing multiple hats right now. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wear a bunch, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, uh, but. Keith Haney, I pretty much uh, got eight car dealerships, a racetrack, and a racing organization. Um, and I just heard a little bit about dirt track racing. We're building a state-of-the-art uh, dirt track facility as well. Right now. During all the <laughs> we're still building one, like a dummy. So. Well, I was telling Clint a little bit about um, that the Tulsa had been you know, really at the forefront and you guys are, are often Tulsa Raceway has often been at the forefront of racing in terms of technology, in terms of audience participation, in terms of trying new things. Keith has been a panelist for us before in how to really like successfully manage a track and attract business and use new technologies. And, um, you know, I I think that (laughs) social media, again, as, as Clint was talking about, um, we were talking about live streaming. You guys, I know, did a pay-per-view early on in the pandemic. You have done yep. streaming from the track before. Um, and uh, we, do, we do streaming just uh, as far as the Midwest drag racing uh, right. series. We're streaming at every event. Right. Um, but also, we've been streaming since I, uh, Todd and I bought it in 2011. Right. So we've been streaming uh, for a long, long, long time now. Um, I guess there's a lot of new ways of doing the streaming. Um, uh, we're getting hit up by um, a few organizations because of the dirt facility. Right, so I, of course. It's kind of Flow, Sport, Flow Sports kind of owns the corner, I think, on that streaming as far as dirt track racing goes. Yeah, totally. Um, we were talking briefly before this about um, how the nature of racing and the race community has changed both over sort of the last 10 years, but um, specifically over the last six months. And I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit, because you see so much different types of racing. You have multiple events at the raceway. You have your own series. You also are a driver. Um, so you are part of the community on multiple levels. Um, so I'm wondering what you have seen change kind of in, in the natural evolution of it over the last few years, but then also over the last six months or so as, as things have been crazy pants. Well, I think uh, uh, over the years, things have changed just because everything's gotten better as far right. as technology uh, um, the reach to being able to get to your uh, your followers a little bit better. It's easier to reach those people now with, than it was before we had to buy TV and all that. Right. That's all changed. We probably already spoke to it. It's more on the social level, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, email blast, um, we found that it's all, all that has made it more cost effective for racetracks to do better um, for a lot less money right. and get more return. Uh, right. 
I think we've noticed that. I think more than anything, um, the technology, uh, like we came out with an app, I um, worked with an organization that came out with an app where we don't now need a person at our, our scales and are at the end giving out tickets for their ETs. We now do that with an app on our phone. Right. So people can just type in their number, boom, there's a run, um, and they're shut ready to go. Sorry, I got a little cold. No um, worries. <laughs> but, and then, of course, now online registration um, has gotten bigger where they're actually registering online before they ever get to the racetracks. And that's kind of streamlining the less contacts as far as through the COVID stuff now. But I think we've been pretty fortunate in the Tulsa market uh, and Oklahoma in general is that, again, in May, during the pen, uh, when the pandemic started, um, we were the only racetrack Mm -hmm. one racetrack across the well as far as i know anywhere that i know of mm -hmm. because they've closed it down everywhere nhra uh, pdra all, all these racetracks were closing right. because they're in different parts of the country and us right. were fortunate enough to be able to stay open and the series being fortunate enough to complete every single race right um and that's because when we started when it started and we had our deal in May, we went to the mayors and all these places, made sure that we were doing it right, had the sanitizing stations, mm -hmm. had to, had to make, um, put X's in the rows. If you see that now across everything now, right. the X's in the row don't sit here. Um, um, and so we, uh, bathrooms being cleaned every so many, uh, every 30 minutes, um, sanitizing coming in and out, no doors open, no doors where they're shut, where you gotta put your hands on it um, to, not to totally, you know, everything being okay. When the payouts were time for payouts, they got mailed to them. So there right. was no contact really in drag racing. And I think in motorsports all around, there's really not a whole lot of contact. Right. Um, in, at least running an organization, uh, having a racetrack, uh, there's more contact in the dealership stuff than there totally. is. At, at a racetrack because customer walks in they're really not touching anything other than food right and they are sitting in the stands and touching the stands but if you keep them sanitized and all that stuff so i think really the touch points there wasn't a ton we had automatic flushers so they didn't need we put don't flush it'll flush for you you know we had those up there i mean all those things you'd be surprised and then in the restrooms and we had sanitation stations inside the private stalls. I mean, there was things that we did, which ultimately moved. Um, we had national news here, local news here. We had everything here. That actually, uh, other organizations took what we were doing. And Todd right. Martin, got to give Todd all the credit for of that. Of course. He's in the environmental stuff, and he's my partner at the racetrack. So he wrote out the whole plan, did everything as far as that goes, got it laid out. Um, but now that is being used across the country in all motorsports, I believe, yeah. kind of a, uh, some way, form, or fashion. They found out because we started it. We right. were really the only ones that were open. Right. So, um, and still open. And right. we had 32,000 people at our last race. Now, all those weren't there at one time. Right, but still. Um, but, the, but they had just as many leaving as coming in and uh, uh, in a three day event. Uh, so we really, um, that really turned out, I'm sorry, people, no worries. Let me, yes, 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 you're good, thank you, Bye. sorry, I had to say yes. Uh, no worries, I get it. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it just seems like now uh, everything's starting to open up, well, let me rephrase that, a month and a half ago, everything was opening up. Right. Now you start looking at some of the statistics and now because the weather is changing, mm -hmm. things are rapidly rising. Yep. I'm more worried about today of them pushing things back because the cases have went up. Right. All these things. I mean, everybody's kind of sick of the sick of the set at home and they're all just saying, heck with it. We're going racing or we're going right. to the park or we're, we're, we're going to the restaurants. We're going to these places. Um, so I think as far as motorsports go, they need to look at it. There's not a whole lot of touch points. If you go into a restaurant, you're touching something all the time. Yeah. I don't care. The waiter's bringing you. And if they got plastic gloves on, the only one they're protecting is themselves, not you, because that plastic right. glove touched the glass a while ago. So, I mean, uh, at least at a racetrack, 
they come up, you're giving them a styrofoam glass with a cup and they're going off with it. You don't see that cup again. Right. Uh, and uh, so I think the changing today is more of, of how we're doing things and how we react to it. And uh, this, I mean, I don't know if it's gonna end or if it's not gonna end, if we're gonna have a cure, not gonna have a cure, but at the end of the day, everybody's still gotta operate a business. Right. And I think the dirt world actually has been open greater in my opinion. I think that when um, kind of after we opened up, boom, there was, everybody was, I mean, everything was kind of opened up. So I think in the dirt world, there was a little more racing opened up and less, less canceled than probably ours. I could be wrong, but. Uh, no, I think that's true. I mean, we, we monitor, certainly we monitor like World of Outlaws and Lucas Oil and um, they kept a lot of their schedules going. I mean, there were certainly gaps. Um, like I know that the the final race for one of the Lucas Oil series that was supposed to happen is is not going to happen, but they are still doing a wrap up in uh, in Charlotte, I think. Um, and I think some of that is is for those reasons, right? Like there's not as much, um, there's not as many touch points. Um, I guess I think that's my guess. Um, and and I think some of it's the crowd. If I had to say, I think that's what the crowd too. You're less likely to stay home. I don't know. I don't know if that's a if that's a stereotype or not. Um, because I, I don't really know what the audiences have been like. I know some of them were running without audiences too. So well, I can um, tell you right now, if you ask just about every business, the business is good. Yeah. Um, uh, your marketing. I think what's going to change though is some of the marketing partners are going to see the big dollars that they were spending on the big things. Mm -hmm. What didn't. They, they are now looking at it and say, you know, that ROI wasn't as great. Look yes. at our returns and we're not spinning it. So yeah. I think that could be, that could hurt motorsports and um, all sports. I think yeah. some of that could hurt it with the fact that, okay, I didn't spend this million dollars. I didn't lose it either. Right. So, right. Uh, <laughs> so I, think, I, I think that we're going to find that. Um, some of that could change moving forward. I mean, just like the Coca-Cola deal and the NHRA right. deal. Right. I mean, they backed up. So uh, how, I don't know the situation and it's not my concern, but I do know that things are changing and I think we'll see um, more strategic placement of a lot of marketing partners' money. I think that's forward. probably I mean, true. I think that's probably true. I, I, but once our business goes backwards, They'll say, "Oh, we need to go spend it again." Yeah. So I think I'll, it, it can be a big turnaround. I, and uh, but I'm excited about 2021. Um, again, we got to get through the election process and, totally. and and see where the country is and whether who wins either side. You know, um, it is going to have a direct reflection in 2021 for sure. Right. I believe. Totally. Whoever gets in office, so and. You won't hear me say my side. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. um, I'd love to hear from both of you. So we talked a little bit about the past and what things are changing. What are some um, What are some other evolutions in the future of racing that the two of you see? So Clint, I'd love you to have you talk from your perspective. And then Keith, I'm going to direct this to you a little bit for, for both the Raceway, but also the Pro Mod series, because I think there's so much interesting stuff that that series reflects. Um, what are you looking forward to? going into the next year and then beyond. Um, and what kind of changes are you guys seeing beyond the stuff from the pandemic, beyond the the, the touchless contact and those sort of things, which I, I think may be here to stay to a certain extent. Um, I like not having to stand that close to people, but that's because I don't like crowds that much. Um, but you know, that that's just me. But what are some of the ways that you see racing or your aspects of racing changing and evolving over the next few years. And, and I know it's hard to divorce it from the business aspect. And I, I don't necessarily think that you guys should divorce it from that. So it can be both like, oh, this is sort of my vision of it, but also this is how I see our business evolving um, in the face of racing. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the future we kind of saw in the last six months, maybe the direction that we're headed. I think, um, and I, I keep talking about the, the broadcast and streaming explosion. I, I think we're going to see Huge, yeah. that continue to, to push and evolve. Mm -hmm. um, but, but more so than that, I think we're going to see more on-demand programming for, right. from broadcast and streaming. I mean, 
Flow Racing is is one of the the leaders in that content creation. Um, mm. you know, not only do they have uh, the live events, but they're putting together interviews with you know Kyle right. Larson or Tyler Courtney or Scott Bloomquist or, or documentaries even. So I think we're going to see a lot of on-demand programming uh, from the various different media companies, Dirt Vision, Flow, Speed 51, Lucas Oil TV, et cetera. Uh, I also think we're going to see a lot more interaction with uh, the drivers. I, I think right. they're going to start creating their own podcasts and they're, you know, they already have their own brand, but they're going to try to evolve that a little more. Um, more interaction between the fan series, drivers, sponsors, all of that. But from the event perspective, and Keith probably can speak to this just as much as I, uh, and maybe probably even more so, is um, I think you're going to see a lot more midweek events. Okay. And that drives directly to the streaming side of things. Now, right. um, I, I go back to this example, football, the Mac. Right. You know, the Mac plays their games on Tuesdays and Wednesdays sometimes yeah. because they know they're on Saturday. They're not going to be able to get the eyeballs that are watching right. Alabama versus Florida. So the same thing here. I think you're going to see a lot more Wednesday, Thursday, maybe even Sunday events, knowing mm-hmm. that uh, they're going to have, you know, the entire game to themselves. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of that stuff uh, happening in, in the next, uh, you know, certainly I actually think you'll see a lot of that stuff you know, happening next year. I know already in the dirt world, yeah. There's a, uh, a series that and I would call it more of a mere, mini series that is sparking up that is going to have you know, 10, 12 events that are ran on Wednesday and Thursday and streamed exclusively through Flow. Um, so, yeah, I think we're going to see a lot of a lot of that stuff happening. Excellent. Excellent. How about you, Keith? Thoughts on the way that. Uh... I think uh, as far as the series goes. You know, us moving to different venues next mm-hmm. year and strategically knowing where to go. Yes. So our schedule, our schedule that it will be out, uh, again, talking for the Midwest Drag Racing Series, um, that schedule will be out the end of this week. Right. And when you see where we're going, it's in places that are open. Yeah. Um, which is big. Right. Uh and it makes it where, at least for that organization, we, you know, we are, the Midwest helps racetracks make money, basically is what it boils down. We get nothing right. when we walk in the door. Right. We give and we get nothing uh, other than a purse and a place to race. But, and the racetrack keeps it all so that it makes it real good for the series goes. I think that you're going to see um, as business has been good and people haven't spent as much money either. So think right. about this on the personal aspect. So that a lot of things were cut in racing across the world. So some of those funds that they were spending are going to be available more right. when it opens up. So you, I think you'll see a lot of newcomers. I think you'll to the sport. So I think you'll see a lot of, uh, new sponsors even to the sport with people opening up business that all during this time that want to get deeper into stuff right. or, you know, fortunate for us that we've completed every, that that series completed every event. So we have numbers that no one else has. Right. Um, right. And I can tell you by talking to a lot of racetracks and I'm on a, on a U, United States, uh, Motorsports Council, mm-hmm. the U.S. Motorsports Association. Um, a lot of racetracks that are open are doing absolutely outstanding, the best they've ever done. Mm-hmm. Why? Because there's less of it. Right. So when you have less choices, it makes it where if you're open, well, we're going there. Right. So right. I think I think people better, all organizations better watch when it opens up. Right. That they did because it, during this pandemic, less people were doing it. They better structure themselves right, or they're going to find themselves in a in a in a in a position where it it's not as good. Right. Because there's more organizations, like it says, more series coming back, doing full right. schedules. You know, now when the schedules were all cut, well, they made a choice to go to this one, which they wouldn't have done before. Right. Right. So. Um, as far as the sport evolving, I think he's probably right. I think you're going to see a lot more streaming stuff. I think racetracks are feeling that, Hey, if I'm not going to have spectators, I'm going to make them pay for it to watch it online. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so I think that that is evolving. I don't know about any weekday stuff, uh, at least not for drag racing, because all of a lot of the drag racing side is it's a lot of preparation all right. week long before it gets to it. And I think on the dirt track world, um, it's not near as volatile, uh, you know, right. <laughs> you can do a lot of, you can do a lot yes. of stuff quicker. Uh, uh, you can service a car in an afternoon, right? Not like a, like, for instance, my pro mod car, it takes me, I got to order parts. I got to have this, I got to have that. I'm blowing it up. You know, I got to get it time to get it work. Um, and also, uh, I think when it opens up a little bit more, we're going to find a lot more back ordered stuff. Totally. So that's so, so you look at manufacturers right now, they're all on back order right now. They let yeah. off people and now their business is picked up. Yeah. Well, now nobody, nobody can work fast enough to get things done. Right. So there's been a lot of good and a lot of bad. Anything in the steel or less hands on, more pre register stuff. We're going yeah. to see a lot more than just showing up at the gate for organizations, racetracks across the country. I think it's going to be a lot of pre pre register stuff where you show up and boom, yeah. you're already there. you've been in for a week. And it makes it for marketing 10 times better if you pre-register because we totally. know you're coming. Totally. And now we can promote you. I mean, those are the things. Hey, this star's coming to our race. So um, I think you'll see some of that uh, change moving forward. And um, again, everybody better get their expenses in line because when it opens back up, there's going to be less pop. What... Um I mean, I think that's a really good point. Like both the pre-registration and the the ability to market um, going forward. You know, there's a lot. We work with a lot of really small racetracks, right? Where they don't have an email listed. They may not. They may have a website, but it's just a like static page that has basic info. Um, what are those smaller tracks going to have to do to shift and be able to accommodate this kind of pre-registration potential streaming? Like, do you think we're going to see even more small racetracks closing as a result, or do you think that they're going to figure out how to pivot and talk to their local audience or any, I hate to ask you guys to speculate think, as you both are I at think, the forefront, but. I think you're going to see some racetracks close. Yeah. Um, I think you're going to see that the financial burden that it's mm -hmm. done to them. Um, and there'll be somebody to pick that track up. So they'll right. close somebody up, you know. They can listen to Racing Junk. <laughs> yeah. A good example, a good, good example is Route 66 mm -hmm. in Atlanta. I mean, they're closed. Yeah. It's going to be, everything's going to be sold off and they're going to build a housing addition or whatever it is they're building there. So that was a shocker. Beautiful yeah. facility. Yeah. And totally. yet now, now they're closing. So I think you'll find a lot of little mom and pots. I was talking to a racetrack just today that didn't even have internet service. Mm hmm so that's i don't know where you at you don't have internet service mm -mm. Uh, you, uh, you figure out a way to have it yeah so i think you're gonna find i hope not but um i think you'll find some series going away whether it's dirt racing drag racing uh doesn't matter what i think right. we'll see some stuff going going backwards uh and, and tighten it back up and those that have survived it will will stand but it takes income to do that totally eventually you have to go to work if you're not making any exactly and I think that's what we're finding some people doing now yeah totally clint any thoughts on that i mean i know it's sort of a different perspective from your business but you've worked in this you know yeah, you mentioned the, the pre-registration side of things. Um, if, if a track out there is watching this and, and they want to do pre-registration, I mean, it's, it's a really simple process. <laughs> uh, You're like, let me help you. <laughs> uh, reach out to your local web guy, whoever is doing your stuff. All it is is a form and um, and attaching a payment gateway to it. I mean, we, we do that. We've started doing that when this whole pandemic started with, with a lot of our clients through Firethorn mm -hmm. who were wanting to do pre-registration. And it, literally it was an hour of my time to set up their pre-registration for out event. So it's not that, not that challenging um, to do in terms of a track wanting to, to do streaming uh, again, there's, there's just so many other, so many options out there right now that any track can choose uh, and it doesn't really cost them anything. I mean, most of the services out there are just taking a percentage of the sale. There might be a little flat rate in there, but 
um, you know, we, I know some small tracks that started on streaming for this and, uh, you know, never thinking that they would make a dime off of it and, mm-hmm. and they did exceptionally well. Right. So, um, I would just say to any track out there, both, both access to pre-registration and a streaming service for your venue, they're all out there and, and they're not a dime a dozen, but, but they're easily found and extremely affordable. I think that probably will make a lot of people feel good. Cause I think it's probably more an emotional and mental sea change for folks. Sure who are used to running it and, you know, very old school Friday night, Saturday night drags, or, you know, you show up, you pay your fee. And really the idea of embracing these technologies on a larger business scale, as opposed to a more personal scale can be daunting for people. And I think just, you know, encouraging them to, to see that like, no, this is doable. This is something that is, is mainstream or, and it's going to grow more. So is really important. Yeah. Um, um, and yeah. Uh, you know, you, you have to have an open mind and you have to uh, adapt to survive. And if you don't, as Keith said, there might be some, some closures here or there. Yeah. Um, the, the last question I kind of want to pose to you guys, in part because Clinton and I had talked about it a little bit with a, a business that he is, is getting ready to launch, is how is the evolution of both the racer and the fan? What are you guys seeing in terms of how, what racers need to be capable of, right? It's not enough for them to just be able to drive anymore, right? Like Keith, if you couldn't promote yourself, you A, wouldn't have this expanding series or be able to keep driving, right? Like, so you can't just be somebody who gets behind the wheel anymore. You have to be able to be a visible presence so that people know you're out there, right? How is that gonna become more important? How has that evolved? What are we seeing as a driver? And then again, we'll talk a little bit about fans to wrap it up. I, I struggle uh, with the with the Midwest Drag Racing Series and the racetrack. So because I own both. Right. And I'm a racer. Right. Um, I have to separate myself from that. Totally. So I have good people that I've got uh, working for me in the Midwest and we have good people on the racetrack. So when some, so I've had to separate myself and move away from it because it's not always about me. Like the series is about all the racers. Right. So although I own it, right. and I'm a drag racer, and I'm one of those, sometimes you fight. At least I do. Um, with well, it's all about him. So in the last couple of years, I've removed myself and I've let my staff handle it. And when they ask me a question, I have no idea. <laughs> although I have the answer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> answer it i have no idea what time right. is the i don't know look at the schedule but right. just like i have to i think they put one out. it's probably over there i you know uh, so uh, I, we do a lot more um on both the racetrack and so i'll answer for both yes please you know, for the fan and for the racer so with the midwest drag racing series and toss raceway park we promote our racers. And again, that goes back to pre-registering. If we know they're coming, mm-hmm. we'll go put a blurb about them, a picture about their car or whatever. Well, what does that do for them? That helps them if they do have a sponsor. Right. Their sponsor gets that highlight too. Right. And we do a lot of tagging and things like that. When we do post them, we tag their sponsor mm-hmm. to make their sponsor feel well in that particular post. And then they go and share it. And they get their friends to share it, and they get their friends to share it, and their, ta- their sponsors seeing triple, double, quadruple, whatever. And it goes on and on. But I think promoting the racer, the fan sees that too. Right. So the fan's following you on your social. So, for instance, Tulsa has 150,000 followers. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when we promote somebody, not all 150 see, those who follow it the most do. Um, with the algorithms and everything of Facebook, we used to primarily Facebook and uh, and uh, and Instagram. So, right. so um, the fans seeing if they're following us, they're seeing it, or if they've been clicking on us, you know, with the algorithms, it puts it to the front. So, so we're promoting them, and the fans seeing it, and we do a lot of events like the, we own a two uh, two seated dragster so we we do share this tag a friend mm-hmm. ours now is you got to tag a friend you can't just like it and share it you got to tag a friend right because if you don't there's no there's no facebook figured out how to um, yeah. make it we're liking it and sharing it doesn't mean somebody sees it yeah totally. so if you tag someone that it, it, it shoots it forward so uh i think that 
is the way you, you ask how do we get in the boat? That's how we get the boat is, right. is, is promoting, promoting them within the organizations. And again, that goes back to pre-register. And if you know they're coming, right. it makes it easy to promote. Yes, <laughs> totally, totally. So uh, I, I believe, you know, a, a driver is a public figure. Right. They have to be willing to promote themselves. Right. And the track obviously helps that too, um, in order to sell tickets and, and get people there. But, you know, the driver's motives might be a little different than the track's motives sometimes in promoting themselves. Totally. Uh, so, you know, in, in the dirt racing world specifically, and I'm not, I can't speak to the drag racing world, merchandising is insane. Absolutely. Right. Insane. You can have a guy like, uh, let's say Rico Abreu. Who, who may show up at Pennsylvania and uh, not make the show, which more often than not he does, yeah. but not make the show, but but sell five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars in merchandise and fake mullets that people will wear, <laughs> you right. know. With the so <laughs> yeah. so um, it, it's so important for a driver to recognize that, that they have to be willing to promote themselves through interaction of social media at the venues, whatever it might be. Um, if, if you're not, you're literally leaving dollars, not just from, from merchandising, but potential sponsors, et cetera, on the table. Um, and, and you mentioned something earlier that, that we're rolling out that a lot of drivers are really, really excited about. There's a product called Rev. And mm -hmm. what that will allow fans to do is go to Rev, search their favorite short track racer, and request a personalized video from them to a family member, their husband, you know, their, their kid, themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, where a guy like I don't know, Scott Bloomquist would you know, pull out his phone and, and make a short 30 or 60 second video uh, wishing you a happy birthday or happy anniversary or, or a motivational uh, pep talk or whatever it might be. So, um, and the drivers are excited about that because one, they realize they can make a couple of dollars with it, but also they're, they're creating fans when they do that too. Um, you, you have that personal connection with a driver if they've taken the time to create a personalized video for you wishing you a happy birthday or whatever it might be. So I guess the answer for me on, on that question would just be the, the willingness for a, a driver to uh, promote themselves is, is what's going to sustain them, um, at least in the social world and, and give them the most opportunity to be successful going forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's great. Well, I think what I'd love to do to wrap this up is just to ask you to what you are most looking forward to in the next year or so, whether it is a, a personal element of your business. Um, Keith, I'm sure that the expansion of the, the series is very exciting, but you always have stuff in the works. Clint, you clearly do too have business stuff, but as, as members of the race community, as people who have businesses who are drivers who are, are representing multiple parts of it, what are you most looking forward to in the next coming year? I mean, for me, I, I think th this goes without saying probably for everyone is just some sense of normalcy of and consistency and, and knowing what you're getting into. You, you alluded to earlier, uh, the World of Outlaws, their, their world finals right. was, was canceled. But then, you know, another event came in the last call and, and took its place. Right. But there, there's numerous events all across the country that have been, you know, the, the Dream, the World 100, the Knoxville Nationals, and certainly some of the drag racing side as well that uh, just didn't happen this right. year. And uh, I think for me, and on all my businesses as well, it's just a sense of normalcy and some structure to right. um, not just the racing scene, but the world in general. Right. Right. Um, and uh, that that uh, gives me some sense of security if there's just a little more structure given the circumstances. Fair, totally fair. <laughs> How about you, Keith? I believe uh, I'm going to have to say that he kind of wrapped it all up. Right. I, I agree 100%. That's why I went first. I believe, I believe, <laughs> believe that uh, we need that to be able to put together uh, plans and proposals and things that we all have, his businesses, my businesses, right. racetracks, everywhere. Some normalcy means, hey, we can go to that marketing partner and say, hey, do you want to put a banner up? Right. I'm just using that for an example. And we are going to have our events right now. Right. They don't know if they're going to have their events. So totally. why would a marketing partner give you any money if they don't know what's going on? Yeah. So, you know, like that's what I was saying as far as we, the Tulsa and the Midwest Drag Racing Series, uh, we've been fortunate. Yeah. We've delivered on all our promises. Right. And and, and even more so, even better because our everything's up. Right. But there's a lot of people that can't say that. and right. And some of them are going to have to do that next year to fulfill – yeah. their obligations that they had for 2020 yeah so totally. um i think i think normalcy and 
some sort of sense of direction. I think once if there's a cure or if we get past the election or what it is, I don't know. Right. But we need some sort of normalcy. I and mean, they're making it where you can go get a test now and know your results in 15 minutes. That's yeah. pretty nice. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that are moving forward, but not fast enough for uh, everybody to make plans right. for 2021. Exactly. Um, that's why I strategically placed our staff strategically placed where we're going mm -hmm. by knowing what they've done through this whole thing. So right. there's some states that just say, heck, we're going to keep going. Um, and we're going to do it this way and we're going to do it right. And then some states say, oh, no, I'm not going to do that because I might get sued. Right. <laughs> so, and then we, but hopefully some normalcy. And, and, and I think what's even more exciting is just to see us all the new stuff that's going to come in 2021 if we do get that normalcy. Absolutely. Um, new things, new places, new things, everything new. It could be cool. I'm very excited. Well, I'm excited to see see both of your, uh, like I said, multiple businesses continue to evolve. Thank you guys so much for being part of this panel and for you know sharing your expertise with our audience. Um, we really always love having you guys. I'm sure that our audience members may have some questions for you and I'll make sure they get to you in the future um, when this airs for the virtual trade show. Um, otherwise, again, thank you guys so much and we look forward to speaking with you soon. Thanks for having us. Bye guys.